For the last two weeks now, I've had this poem in my head. Everyone is God speaking. Why not be polite and listen to him? The poet is Hafiz, who lived during the 14th century in what is now Iran. He was a practitioner of Sufism, which is a mystical tradition within Islam. What speaks to me about the poems of Hafiz, and this poem in particular, is the way he recognizes the oneness of God in everything and everyone. Although he comes from a completely different faith tradition than we do, he sees and testifies in his own way to the same truths seen and testified to by Christian mystics, people like Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. One of the ways these mystics often talked about this truth was by using the image of marriage. Teresa and John in particular spoke of a union between the Christian and Christ as a nuptial union, describing it as a marriage. And so reading these texts today, I wonder if this nuptial image, this marital image, which is, by the way, much older than Teresa or John or Hafiz, is part of the reason why the scriptures, both Hebrew and Christian, seem to be so concerned about marriage. There are not only numerous laws about marriage and adultery in Torah, we also get this intimate and profound justification for those laws in the story we read today from Genesis. The epistles of the New Testament frequently talk about proper and improper sexual practices and relationships and place a high value on marital fidelity or even celibacy. What if the lawyers and the prophets and the apostles wrote so much about this, not simply for the purpose of property law or maintaining purity, but because Jews and Christians alike recognized marriage as a sign of the relationship that God has entered into with us? The prophets, for example, especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel, often compare Israel to the bride of God, an unfaithful bride. Hosea graphically illustrates Israel's relationship with God by marrying a prostitute and then giving his own children meaningful names like unloved and not my people. Then, of course, there's the Song of Solomon, an erotic love poem in which two lovers pine for one another and praise each other's beauty. The book has a long history of metaphorical interpretation as the love of God and humanity for one another. We can't read St. Mark's story today without thinking about these things. Without this background, this is simply a commandment about divorce, the justification for, for various church doctrines such as annulment and excommunication. But in context, becomes a story about what God has intended for all of us from the beginning and the ways that we fall short of and resist those intentions. Jesus says <clears throat> that although the law allows for divorce, it was Moses' provision for our hardness of heart, not a divine mandate. God's work, you see, is to join together Separation is our work. It happens when we are unwilling or unable to participate in God's work. For example, when prophets use marital metaphors to, to describe God's relationship with Israel, even when Israel is portrayed as faithless and adulterous, God continues to be faithful. Jeremiah describes the covenant God made with Israel at Sinai and calls it a covenant they broke, though I was their husband says the Lord, and then describes God's continued work to renew that covenant in spite of Israel's infidelity. That Jesus seems to be so adamant that even legal divorce is adultery, a crime, by the way, which carries the death sentence, it makes me wonder if he's not talking about marriage between spouses here, but rather the marriage between God 
and God's people. The capital nature of this offense underscores the importance this relationship has to God. To divorce ourselves from God is to condemn ourselves to death. And for God to divorce us, well, that would be unfathomable. It would go against God's very nature. If God were ever to do such a thing, God would not be God. The implications of this seem to explain, to me at least, why Jesus is so harsh and strict in this one particular point of Mosaic law. You'll notice that Jesus quotes from Genesis, from the story we read today. In that story, the man and the woman are not just alike or complementary. They're the same. She is bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. That is why, as Genesis says, they become one flesh, because they were already one from the beginning. In the story recorded just before it, God says, Let us create humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And that's just what God does. In the image of God, they created them. Male and female, God created them. Each and every person is created in the image of God. Which is to say, each and every person is a unique expression of God. And because God is one, because God is not really separate from the things that God creates, which bear God's image, it means that we also are one in God. And so divorce isn't really about the dissolution of a marriage. It's about separating what God has created from the beginning as one. Not just spouses, but the divorce of any one person from any other. This is a story about relationships that are broken. All relationships. Thomas Merton writes, In my soul and in your soul I find the same Christ who is our life. And he finds himself in our love. And together we all find paradise which is the sharing of his love for his Father in the person of their spirit. Our self-separation, our divorcing of one another, is a self-imposed death sentence as we cut ourselves off from the God who dwells in the people around us and prevents us from finding this paradise. This is also, I think, why St. Mark follows this teaching on divorce with this apparently unrelated story of Jesus welcoming the little children. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it, he says. Although it's really kind of hard to understand what that means. As I read these two stories together, I wonder if Jesus isn't offering this vision of entering the kingdom of God as a little child entering life, as he described it last week, as an alternative to this vision of the ways that we separate one another. It is our hardness of heart, Jesus says, that makes separation happen, makes it necessary. It's our need to cut ourselves off from those who we deem to be not one of us, our desire to control to whom we are joined and not joined. But if you think about it, little children have no such needs or desires, nor even the capability to imagine such things. They can't change who their family is. They can't even conceive of the desire to do so. Family is simply a reality, as immutable as the stars in the sky. I wonder, as I read this story, if that's what Jesus is getting at as he takes these children in his arms. The disciples, attempting to divorce these children from him, as it were, miss the point, but Jesus knows that these children, as well as their parents and their communities, and even the stodgy disciples trying to stand between them, are all siblings 
in God's family. All unique expressions of the one who makes us one from the very beginning. And that without one another, we are not whole. The separateness that the disciples see and try to enforce is an illusion. That divorce that we try to enforce between one another is an illusion. What God has joined together, no one is able to separate, but that doesn't stop us from trying. And it's in that trying that we subject ourselves so often to the unquenchable fire and the undying worm of Gehenna. Because such separation denies not only who God is, but who we are, who we were created to be from the beginning. St. John writes, We love because God first loved us. Dr. James Finley, author and psychologist, says it this way, At first it seems as if compassionate love originates with our free decision to be as compassionate as we can. But as our practice of compassion deepens, we come to realize that in choosing to be compassionate, we are yielding to the compassionate nature of God flowing through us. God creates us in God's own compassionate image to be compassionate, to love as we are loved. When we participate in that love, we are only yielding to the nature of God within us. When we resist that love, we instead condemn and separate and divorce one another. We deny our humanity by denying who God has created us to be and attempting to recreate ourselves in our own image. To reject love is to swim upstream, to fight a losing battle. To accept love and practice compassion is to accept our birthright. It is to recognize that my love for my neighbor is the same thing as my love for myself. Because in God, my neighbor and I are one. And yet, as Moses realized, sometimes divorce, whether between spouses or siblings or anyone else, is sometimes necessary. Sometimes the relationships that should give us life instead take it. Though I may love another, though I may practice compassion for another, they may hate or even unintentionally harm me. And sometimes the most compassionate response is to let go of those relationships that are abusive or codependent or parasitic. Sin is real, and brokenness is real. And that is why Moses so wisely made the provision for divorce. Because sometimes a tearing apart is healthier than a slow dying. Sometimes it is better to cut off one hand and enter life than it is to keep both hands and be thrown into the fire of hell. Nevertheless, the hope remains that somehow, just as God created all humankind as one, all humankind will return to our source and be one again. We do not see this hope realized yet, but as the author of the letter to the Hebrews reminds us, we do see Christ. Christ, who is bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. Christ, in whom compassion has taken human form. Even as the political and religious leader of his own time tested and condemned and plotted against him, he offered himself in love for them, for us. Even as he died, he prayed for forgiveness. We may be faithless. We may be prone to separation and divorce, but he is not. If even the cross, the greatest certificate of divorce ever written, signed in blood, can be used by God as a marriage bed, then perhaps even our variously broken and sundered relationships can be the seedbeds of new love as well. 
This is the only reason we have hope for healing. Because although we are enslaved by death, not able to, to bring life from separation, God is, and God does, because that's who God is. If marriage is the image of God's love for us, then Christ is the image of one who will be, is the image of who we can be, who we will be in the perfection of God's love. When what was one in the beginning becomes one once again. Until then, my friend Hafiz reminds us, everyone is God speaking. Why not be polite and listen to him?